the Bioceuticals Integrative Medicine Awards are fast approaching. The Beamers showcase the outstanding talent we have in the Australasian integrative medicine profession and are held in conjunction with the Bioceuticals Research Symposium. To book your ticket to this gala dinner event, visit bioceuticals.com.au and click on the Education tab. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining us on the line today is Rob Santich, who's a practicing naturopath best known for his passion for using herbal medicines. In 2008, he co-authored with Kerry Bone the authoritative text, Healthy Children, Optimizing Children's Health with Herbs. Rob has lectured in many of the naturopathic colleges in New South Wales, including at the Grad Diploma and Masters in Phytotherapy at the University of New England in Armidale. Although Rob is a general herbal practitioner, he has a special interest in the treatment of children, having four of his own aged from 35 years to 17 years, plus four grandchildren now. Rob has a heartfelt passion for traditional healing methods and ceremonies and has studied with both Australian Aboriginal and Lakota healers. He regularly visits the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, USA to do ceremony and study of the many medicinal plants growing there. And I warmly welcome you to FX Medicine. How are you, Rob? Great. Thank you, Thank you Andrew. No, I'm really good. And, um, it, despite the fact I've been doing this for 35 years, I think I'm getting younger. And, <laughs> you know, of course, the longer you do something, the better you get at it. So. Must be all the herbal creams you make and put on your face. <laughs> That's what it is, exactly. And I got sunburned yesterday here in Nelson Bay. <laughs> now, tell us about your career, because, boy, you would have seen some changes. How did you Absolutely. start off? I mean, you would have been considered a druid, wouldn't you? Well, exactly, exactly. So, you know, my, my, my herbal education started on a Friday night in Glebe Town Hall. You know, really? Dennis, Dennis Stewart, uh, uh, the Southern, Southern, Southern Cross Herbal School. The he master. Hired, um, he hired, you know, a room you know, for his Sydney students at, uh, at Glebe Town Hall with a Narcotics Anonymous meeting below us with all the rah, rah, rah and all, all that. Yeah. And then, and then you did your science um, with um, Nature Care. Yeah. So, it was, yeah, it was, you know, kind of um, pioneering, I guess. And it was, you know, it was great. I, I loved it. And because he, you know, what Dennis would do, he would bring a whole heap of potted medicinal plants and the whole back of the, you know, the room was full of, you know, potted medicinal plants. He, mm. he made a great effort to instill, you know, knowledge and passion about the herb itself. So it was great. I'm, I'm really, I'm really grateful uh, for Dennis's education, and I still see him to this day. So it's good. We've been good, good mates all those years. Absolutely. I'll, I'll always hang off one of um, Dennis's best sayings, and he says, "A glass, uh, what is it? a glass of good red wine is not de- is not uh, judged by how much resveratrol is in it." <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It helps, <laughs> but it's not the only and, thing. <laughs> and, and I guess the the salient warning there is: don't just think that standardisation is your quality indicator. It is not. No, that's right. Exactly, exactly. But you would have said, and like, I've got a lot of respect for your ilk, your peers, because you indeed really knew the actual living plant. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. So that, and that's what I try to you know, maintain, because I, I still run kind of workshops, you know, mm. just by myself and a few helpers and um, take people in into the field and, and we're doing another one. I'm, I've teamed up with Andrew Pengelly, who is, and Andrew is one of my teachers. He taught me bot- botany because he, he worked with Dennis and the Southern yeah. Cross Herbal School. Yeah. So we've been mates all this year, all these years. And he's been teaching in America. You know, he got his PhD on an Australian native here in Australia and then you know, it was very difficult for a PhD to get a job in Australia in those in those back in those years mm. um, in herbal medicine. So he got um, he moved to America. Anyway, he's back. So you know, and he's as equally as passionate as I am about you know field work and being involved with with plants. And so we've had um, one late last year up at. It's actually Dennis Stewart's property in in um, in Rossbury, but the next one is going to be in Queensland, in rural 
Queensland in at Mount Barney. And there's a lot of wilderness area around it, so it's, it's accommodation in, you know, homestyle type accommodation. They get their meals. And there's me, Andrew, um, a guy that runs the Byron Bay Distillation Company. I forget. I've met him once. Mm. Um, and, and a few other people. So it's got an essential oil kind of um, feel to it, this one. Yeah. Um, so, you know, because I've got a little still and, 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 and fairly self-sufficient in, in native uh, essential oils. You know, I use a lot of essential oils in topical preparations and get people to, um, and I've got a decongestant rub, which is great for kids. Yeah. You know, it, it's in a laponite gel and, and laponite is a, is a clay gel. Yeah. It's a, it's a ringing gel. So like you remember, remember hair gels and stuff like that. If you flick the jar, it, 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 it um, wobbles. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's a clay that, that is very hydroscopic. So it takes on a lot of water and it sets and then into it, you put, you know, proportions of essential oil. So what you've effectively got is a Vix type preparation mm. without the paraffins and stuff. In yeah, it. parents really love it. You know, parents really love it, and it's really effective for children. It smells beautiful. It's unique. A lot of unique Australian uh, oils in it, and and it's you know doesn't have paraffins in it, so it's great. It's a good product. Let's go back to this these early days where you got to know the plant, use yeah. the plant, and then find out ways and preparations in which you can actually get them used by your your patients. Because let's right. face it, specialising in kids, they're going to be pretty reticent to a lot of herbal extracts. Correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So compliance is a big big issue. But I think I think first of all, if 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 a pra- you know the herbalist has um, tasted it and knows you know all the remedies, and so you know you your your selection criteria is first of all taste. You know I can't give that one because you know a child will no no matter whether you know the child is used to herbal medicines or not. If it's hideous, well then they're not going to take it. It's as simple as that. So mm. so knowing the taste of your remedies is a is a good thing. And then, and then there's other tricks, you know, there's, there's, there's tricks that, you know, all, all kids like things that are sweet, so you can sweeten it up. Now, in days gone by, it would have been, you know, a sugary syrup. Now, we don't do that anymore, but you can use, you know, you'd make a formula up, for instance, and two-thirds of it would be the herbal formula, and that herbal formula would be selected already on the basis of taste as well, so you wouldn't include things like valerian and, and just, you know, the hideous ones. Um, pick a rise. So, I <laughs> pick your eyes out. I had a patient of mine. A patient of mine used to call it call it pick your eyes out. <laughs> it, it's so bad you want to pick your eyes out immediately. <laughs> that was a fairly pretty good description. Anyway, so you, you know you've already and and you you've come up with you know a totally relevant, totally indicated formula that you sweeten up so you can add you know um, um, you know honey to it. You can add um, you know maple syrup those types of things to, to cut it down. But, you know, the bottom line here is that, is that um, golden seal will always taste like golden seal. Mm. You know, it'll come through. That bitterness will linger. So, you know, then, you know, the remedy, the dose is then followed by, you know, a drink of water or, or something, you know. And bribery is good good in, a, in um, yeah. you know, uh, an instance like this. But there's nothing wrong with bribery. <laughs> I'll, I'll always remember uh, my eldest son, his fifth word was etnasia. <laughs> and yeah, yeah three syllable word it was a cracker and um my youngest son used to take take a i think it was a liquid fish oil and without right. any without any hesitation whatsoever but he'd yeah. always always want to get his lolly afterwards there was always this yeah but exactly. can, I, can I have my squirm exactly. now yeah so yeah, not saying right. that I was necessarily doing the right thing but, but it was only one you know it's a, you know it's you, Getting them into them is the is the battle. And now, if there's a compromise in terms of a sweet afterwards, well, then so what, mate? You know, so what? That's good. Yeah. You know, the benefits far outweigh. You know, getting it in is better than not getting it in. Is my, my philosophy. And you do whatever it takes. So, for the, there's another trick of mine too that's described in the book. It's uh, you know, so all else has failed, right? So you sweeten the remedy, and and the parents on board. Uh, you know. Uh, you know, continually trying to get it in into the child and it still doesn't work. Um, you can make up, now, those that are truly committed, you can use a juice with agar gel. You know, you can buy agar gel. You can buy organic agar gel. So you can make, you make your own jelly, right? 
Yeah. So, or you can just buy jelly, you know, I mean, it's all full of sugar and garbage. So, so it's preferably not the option. Um, but, you know, again, it depends on how much time a parent has. And a lot of them don't have a lot of time to mess around with, you know, stuff. Anyway, so you make a jelly whichever way you make it. And then you pour it into small ice cube um, I like container. You know, yeah, you know, small, small, you know, small um, compartment. Portions, ice yeah. Cube. And then you say so you've decided on a dose, you know, you've made a formula and you've figured out the dose and it might be like four drops, three times a day. And you just drop those drops, four drops or whatever it is, into each of those compartments and it immediately disperses in the jelly. You don't need to mix it. it just, and you can see it disperse through the jelly. Wow. And then you bung it in the fridge and then, and then the child has a jelly. Yeah. And but gold, golden seal will always taste like golden seal. Yeah. There'll be a transient bitterness, and and so you address that with you know cold water or whatever. Yeah, but you know what? Like the funny thing is with golden seal. Admittedly, as an adult, is yes, it was bitter, but there was nothing yeah. like that action. That, no, I've exactly. used no herb that gets that action on sinusitis. You got it. You got it. You yeah. got it. That's right. You, you absolutely got it. There's, there's a, we have a lot of supposed alternatives because the fear of when, when gold and silver got ridiculously expensive because threatened in the wild and still threatened in the wild. And so then, you know, you had the growers coming on and to rep, replicate, I understand why it's so expensive because to, to grow gold and seal, you have to replicate the dappled sunlight of the Virginian forest floor. That isn't easy. Oh my that's God. shade cloth. That's shade cloth and the whole number. Yeah. And then and then you wait years for your crop. So is it any wonder that it's ridiculously expensive? Yeah. Yeah. Was it caring for your kids that gave you that sparked this interest in specialising, yeah, if you uh, like, in treating well, kids? Ab- absolutely. And you know, at the time and I'm not quite sure now if there's a unit in paediatrics in, in un, undergraduate education. I don't think so. I'm not quite. Yeah, you know, I don't think. I don't think there is. But the thing is that, that when when you go into practice, who do you see? You see mothers and their children. Yeah. And and so I learnt on my own children. <laughs> I learnt what you could give them, what you <laughs> yeah. couldn't, and how much you how much you should give them. <laughs> Have you seen a change in? either the types of conditions or indeed maybe the severity of conditions that you oh, see in kids a, over the a, years. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think I think it's in, in line with, um, you know, that kind of nutritional degeneration that the Western Price, price people talk about, mm. that, you know, the health of subsequent generations worsens with a you know poor diet from generation to generation. So you see that. So yes, I think I think the children that I'm seeing now are way sicker than what they used to be, and that and that this sort of concept that we have um, about you know a children's vitality it's greater than an adult, and often they just need a little little bit of help and their health bounces back. You know that was true 25 years ago, but it's not true today for most, unfortunately. And 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 the, and the riddle is deep. You know, there's been a, a lot of complicating factors. You know. You know, long-term antibiotics. You know, lots of vaccinations, and poor diet, and molds in the house. You name it. You know, it's a really complex. What are, What about of, kids uh, being of, loaded with you know the stresses of the adults? You know, and just well, exactly. compounding generation to generation. Do you Do you see that? You actually see exactly kids coming in with anxiety, mood disorders now. Yeah, I do. Mm. Exactly. That does I don't think the education system really helps. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, you know, when they're older and they're, they're subject to NAPLAN type testing and all this sort of stuff, mm. you know, and there's a lot of criticism about that with, from key educators and people that have a more holistic kind of view of, you know, what an education should be. Mm. I, I don't think we've got it right. What yeah. I think is uh, one of the greatest shame, we're getting a little bit off topic, is the, the changes. It, it, you know, they'll, they'll try one thing in the education system and say, right, we're doing it this way. Yeah. Why? Because we spent money on it. And so we're exactly. doing it this way for the next three years and then they'll go, that failed. Well, so we'll, well, do the, we'll go back to the old way. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so what about your well, treatments? We're, 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 we're all survivors the public education system. Yeah, that's what I say to my right. children. I survive. That's right. It's up to you now. Yeah, yeah. Well, what about your treatments? Have you found that because the kinds and severity of the different conditions presenting have changed, have your Absolutely. treatments changed or have you changed not, dose? Not, not, or No, I haven't changed anything. But, you know, like 
it's a process, you know. You're a practitioner, you know. It's a process. You can't address everything all at once, even yeah. though the temptation is to, you know, because yeah. the patient wants to get well and they want it. Well, and, well, pa- the parents want them to get well and they want everything to be addressed at the, at the you know, that first go, but you can't. It's as simple as that. Yeah. So you just explain that and um, once, you have their confidence and everybody's on board, you know, you, you work through the riddle. You you work through the health riddle of that person. And, you know, go back to basics. Apply basic principles. Start with the gut. Start with detoxification. You know, if you don't know, if, if there's no clear picture, and sometimes there's not. And do you find that that uh, then expresses the real culprit that you're dealing with? Yeah, exactly. As you, know, you move like, forward? Yeah, that's right. The the real culprit is, a, you know, emerges it's been said um, many years ago to me, there is nothing new under the sun. Do you yeah. find that you, you know, always remember the old ways, um, the old treatments, the old styles even perhaps of treating, and then you'll get a newfangled treatment, the new supplement, the new kit on the block, and, and it's, you know, some of them are worthy, you know, some of them come in a and they stick around. A lot of them are worthy, a lot of them are worthy, yeah. 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 So yeah, tell me yeah. how you blend that. Well, you know, I'm excited when new things come along. I, I am genuinely excited when, oh, my God, you know, it sounds great. And then you have to use it. You have to get experience with it. And some things fall away and some things, some things stick with you. But I'm, 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 mainly, I'm mainly a liquid guy, right? Yeah. So I mainly use liquids. I do use tablets, but only some. Yeah. Um, you know, herbal tablets. And um, so... You know, I've got a huge dispensary. It's it's massive. It's it's, it's one of, one of your bigger dispensaries, and I don't use them all all the time. And you you, you go through phases of of different types of disorders, which use this spectrum of remedies. And but I tell you, one you know, remedies that I use a lot is is liver digestive remedies and, and adaptogens mm. with kids. And you know, then then the, the you know the 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 uh, systems. Um, under stress, I see the most in kids is their nervous system, their digestive system, and their respiratory system. Right. So those types, those types of remedies. Rob, what about having consideration when blending natural therapies with pharmacological mm-hmm. therapies that undoubtedly you'll encounter because, you know, little Johnny's had his fifth beer burst eardrum and, and the mother exactly. is fearful of a, a long-term adverse outcome with hearing or something like that. So how yeah, do you right. work in using herbs with pharmaceutical medicines? Well, you, you're given no choice. Uh, you have to. If, they, if they've come to you for, you know, another view um, and, the, and, you know, it's not not a natural therapist's job to, to take any medications away, is it? No. So we can't we can't do that. So you have to and then and then you just, you know, go to reliable sources for potential herb drug interactions um and, and work through and, and make your remedy choice based on an indication, you know, this herb these you know, this bunch of these bunch of herbs are indicated for whatever's going on here. Check them for any any uh, drug interaction. Um, and you just proceed through it like that. Yeah. I, and, and honestly, I, I have not, oh, all the years, in this, this uh, would include adults too. There's been very, very few. I, I, in fact, I can say, quite safely say, that I have had absolutely no adverse interaction between, between pharmaceuticals and herbal remedies. And, you know, like there was, there was quite a number of years where I was in a, in a clinical support role, and I can tell you that the, the, the majority of the questions were, Herb drug interaction, mm. and um, and also fear around you know prescribing herbal medicines for children. There's a great deal of fear because you know practitioners ha- haven't received any education at the undergraduate level. Yeah, but there's no you know, and the way that I think is well, you know, the medical profession doesn't think twice about administering the most toxic of medications from birth. What are we worried about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good so, point. <laughs> you know, you, 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 you use common sense here, and and but you have to know your herbs. You have to know dosage, how much to give. I mean, even with pharmaceutical medicines, the the dosing um, calculations or normographs that have been used for decades are now yeah, coming right. into question again. So it's like, whoa, right. what are we doing with? It's not like they've got it down pat. So they haven't. That's right. Let's go into dosage considerations. What what right. form do you use? Okay, so um, there's a you know first of all, 
a young child has a greater kind of energy expend- expenditure for than an, an adult, right? Mm. So, and there's calculations, and these calculations are based on, you know, from, you know, from drug therapy pretty much. Yeah. So for a child that is um, you know, less than two, this is the formula. You, you, it's one point five times their weight in kilos plus ten gives you the percentage of the adult dose. Right. So if a child, an example would be, you know, just to make this easier, so the child is twenty kilos, so it's one point five times twenty plus ten, and that's forty. So it's forty percent of the adult dose. So. So and and that's that's the standard dose. So you you put a formula together as you would an adult, twenty mil of this, forty mil of that. You know, you construct it on a weekly dosage calculation, and an adult would take you know um, the average kind of adult, you know, between seventy and eighty kilos would have five mils three times a day. Yeah. Or or, or you know fifteen mils divided by two twice a day, or whatever whatever works. Yeah. So it's that final dose that you subject to that 40% too. So it's the five mils three times a day. Yeah, it's around about two mils. And, you know, and, and we, we've got to say this, is that herbal dosing is forgiving, largely. Mm. Right? It's forgiving. Plus, there's a whole heap of individual responses. So there's the sensitive, there's the not so sensitive, there's the drop doses, you know. They can only ever give drops. And, you know, they're, they're, they're sub-therapeutic as far as we're concerned, but they still work. And then there's the people that you have to, you know, hugely exceed the recommended doses to get anywhere. Yeah. So it's, it's forgiving. But, you know, it's, it's important with, with children that you get it right. So for children under, tw- under two, it's the 1.5 times their weight in kilos plus, four, uh, plus 10 gives you the percentage, which you then apply to your standard dose. And you can, you can apply that to a tablet as well, right? So. Mm. Um, using the previous calculations, it was forty percent of the adult dose. So if 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 the you know minimum dose for whatever tablet it is you've selected for that child, and it have to be an older child, about a school age child, then they then they can start to take tablets. However, um, you know herbal tablets are usually like you know the size of horse tablets. So it's for you know using that example, forty percent of the tablets. So the parent needs a a, a tablet cutter to chop off the forty percent, crush it up. Put it in something, you know. You can put it in like a natural jam or something like that, mm. and give it to them on a spoon. But would you tend to favour then um, liquid herbs over a solid form dosing because you can dose that percentage more accurately? Yeah, yes, I do favour that exactly. Yeah, plus it gives you it gives you if you need to cha- rapidly change the formula. You know, ah, yes, it, it gives you that dosage flexibility. So you know, most children would go away with either a 25 mil or a 50 mil dropper bottle, mm. right? So they're not, if if something untoward or something you've not expected happens and they can't take that remedy, they haven't wasted very much money. Do you find that you might favour different herbs, maybe better tasting? I, I don't know other characteristics I'm, that I'm thinking of, but um, when you're treating kids as opposed to adults, even even though it's in the same group of herbs, like a nervine or an adaptogen or a um, you know a diaphoretic, something like that, do you tend to favour different types of herbs for kids? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the gentler, the ones that lay on the gentler side of the spectrum. You know, when you look at bunch of bunch of herbs mm. that all have the same uh, action and are indicated for that action. Yeah. You know, there's the strong ones through to the weaker ones. Mm. So I, I, you know, for a child, I would select the weaker ones and then another, you know, thought running through my head is how does it taste, that weaker one. Yeah. So the less intense, um, you know, and the less intense taste, but that doesn't mean really that an individual is not going to respond to it in a in a good, robust way. Mm. What about the base? Like, you know, traditionally we use alcoholic extracts, um, okay. fluid uh-huh. extracts, but then you've got... My favourite topic. Okay. So then you've got glycotrax. So, right. for instance, marshmallow in an alcoholic yeah. extract, absolutely abhorrent. Exactly. <laughs> in a glycotract, exactly. yum. Yeah. Like you put exactly. that into somebody who's so got go. a cough, wow. Yeah. The glycotract of marshmallow can act as a taste correctant. So you've got, you know, a range of herbs together that not, are not tasting so good. Um, you can sweeten it up with the glycotract of marshmallow, mm. right? 
Um, and that's good for that. As plus, and you know, if it, if it's indicated for you know some kind of you know spasmodic gut or inflamed gut thing, it's going to help there. Plus, it's a reflex demulsant, so it'll reflex into the urinary system and the and the and the lung and soothe. So you get all that extra extra activity. But you know, I I don't get too hysterical about alcoholic extracts. You know, say say you've got you know, in particularly around the alcohol whole issue, um, because alcohol is our traditional um, menstruum, right? yep. and there's and it it is a really really good um, extractor of a vast range of active principles. Plus, it's a good preservative. Now, you, you also got to look at it too. Okay, so if alcohol is an issue, and, and alcohol can be you know a religious issue, you know rare people can be allergic to it and all that kind of yep. stuff. But most people are okay with you know um, well, on a small amount. Benefit, you know, so you've got you know you put you know, a remedy together and the average, you know, you've averaged it out, it might have, you know, 50% alcohol. So, and that child is having three drops of that remedy three times a day, mm. and 50% of that, that is alcohol. It is insignificant. For goodness sake, don't have a, a, a ripe banana. <laughs> For goodness sake, <laughs> you know. exactly, exactly, because you'll be fermenting more than that mm. off that ripe banana. That's, that's right. So things have got to be put into perspective. The, the benefits outweigh the risks. Most children can deal with it. You know, their alcohol dehydrogenase is developing, and by the time they're school age, you know, they have, you know, the majority of them have, you know, the alcohol detoxification capacity equivalent to an adult. It's as simple as that. Yeah. So, so you know, if a child is otherwise okay, okay, there's no sign of, you know, any liver issues. I have no problem whatsoever in giving alcohol alcoholic extracts. Yeah. What what about um, kids with particular types of say neurodevelopmental disorders? You know, you've spoken at the Mind Forum. Um, mm. What do you do when you're dealing with somebody with Asperger's or ASD or, or even autism? This, this this might lead us off off off, off ingestibles for a little while mm. because I I don't actually start with ingestibles because I know that they're not going to take them. So first of all, they've got to get used to you. And so what I, what I actually use is, is energy devices. And I use, um, you know, these are TGA registered devices. And, um, and so I started with the scanner. Now I use a, it's a device called a physio key. So it's a, it's a, um, you can measure the skin resistance. It gives you a number, you know, so you can put it on, um, the air, you know, various areas of the skin and get a number. Mm. And that number is meaningful. So now after a while, you know, after a couple of talking sessions with, with the parent mainly, you know, the kids are okay now with, with me coming a little bit closer and being able to place these devices, electrode space by electrode space, down their spine. Mm. And I can get an immediate handle on the state of their nervous system. And so not only is it a, is it a diagnostic, it's also a treatment. So once I, once I calm them down a little bit, and their body is and becomes more responsible. Uh, sorry, more more responsive. Mm. The Russians call it dynamic, more dynamic. So more able to roll with the punches rather than being stuck in any particular direction. That's the time to give um, to give remedies, and and then and then you have to be open as to you know how you know how, how are they going to be administered. Yeah. What about essential oils? Love them. Absolutely love them. So Do- yeah. Com- and 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 you know, you know the lemon balms, those types of essential oils are very very calming. So having those, um, you know, diffused into a room, putting those in laponite, you know, mm. and having them, you know, placed on the child's foot or wherever, you know, and yeah. and and having a calming influence. That way, I think it's a good idea. So you have to be creative, and you kind of go, you know, you've got we've got a lot of tools at our disposal, and I think sometimes we get locked into I have to give you know a herbal medicine, I have to give that tablet. There's other ways you can go about things initially to to calm a person down. I think that, that and that's that's really the um, the mission first all first up with with lots of people. First of all, you know. And, you know, developing trust and then calming them down and then, um, you know, coming in with other other remedies. Yeah. Talking about things that are at our disposal, 
um, we're seeing more and more, not a lot, but more and more, uh, some Maori uh herbs coming across mm. to Australia and they've got a yeah, great yeah, system yeah. of medicine oh, they do. They over do. in New Zealand. What about Australian Indigenous medicines though? That's a, been a little bit more difficult because I've been involved for a long time. Now they had a kind of a, a, a different way and and it was, and I think it can, comes down to this and I'm talking specifically about the Australian Aboriginal experience. Yeah. First of all, you know, there's one thing that characterizes Australian plants that, you know, and when you, you know, so you might be looking at, um, you know, a species of plant that are all the same. It's all, you know, the same species, same genera, but they'll have different phytochemicals, uh, different phyto, you know, be made up from a, a bunch of different phytochemicals. So yeah. there's this, this phytochemical, uh, huge variety in eucalypts and every, every plant. Yeah. So there's your problem right there, and I remember being taken out by an Aboriginal elder, and and you know on, on a part of his um, medicine songline, right? Yeah. And only a little part of it. And he said, "See those three plants there?" He said, "See them three there?" He said, "They're all the same to you, and if you wanted to use them, you could pick any three, wouldn't you?" Right. Said, yeah. He said, "Well, it's, they're not all the same to me. It's that one on the end there is my medicine." Ah, uh, okay. Oh. Right, and he knows. He knows somehow. You know, and it, and it, this would be consistent. I'm pretty sure of that. That that would have that particular representative of that particular bunch of plants is the one with the phytochemicals. So there's usually consistency there, right? Yeah. And it's that story of the you know it's only the Amazon shaman that know that know the difference between the two chemo types of cat's claw just by looking at it. Right. It's that type of stuff, right? So yeah. that really characterises Australian plants, and that's why it's been tough in. Um, you know, getting some of these plants into um, into mainstream. Yeah. Plus, they're, they're terribly sensitive as well, you know. At least in New Zealand, there's a treaty and, you know, the relationship, I think, is, is, a, little, is a little different in yeah. New Zealand. Yeah. Was, uh, so the relationship here, here is still fraught with difficulties. My friend Andrew Pangeli, he did his PhD on, on a particular plant. It's called Dodonia viscosa variety angustifolia. So it's a it's a dodonia, and you often see it. It's a quite a pretty looking plant. The the the, um, the common name is hopbush, right? And it's used in landscaping and stuff. And there's a kind of a bronzy variety variety of it. And throughout the Sydney region, it's a common and common understory plant in the sclerophyll forests around Sydney. So this no, is angustifolia. So this is the thin leafed variety. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's right. And which only then grows, you know, uh, up up the hunter somewhere. Mm. Anyway, so um, it has use worldwide. It's a peripatetic plant. And and what it is, it's a cross between comfrey and arnica. Oh, really? Which is a, which, yeah, which is a remarkable, con- you know, and I, I, you, you know, I go make my own extract of hot bush yeah. and, and use it as a topical for healing. Bruises. And, and trauma. And, yeah, exactly. Same, exactly. same risk with uh, blistered skin. Yeah, no, st- no problem. No, no, problem. no problem. Oh, uh, my no goodness. problem because it doesn't have the saponins. So right, it's, it's the issue with um, with arnica. What other considerations can you help our listeners with with regards to kids? Any hints and tricks that you've learnt along the way? Well, one, one thing I've noticed is that there's a you know I've been a parent for quite a few years, and so you know my eldest is thirty five, and I'm staying with at the moment, and the youngest is coming up to seventeen. Right, so. And you go to, the, you know, they've all been to the same primary school, and it's just a different kind of attitude that parent, you know, the parents have these days, where they don't necessarily parent; they, they're more a friend. They try to be a friend, and so, and that's all good, except when it comes to administering things that the child doesn't want. And yeah. a lot of parents give up on that; they they can't, you know. So you need to, you know, really get them on board. So that's a the thing. Then. Don't be worried about the alcoholic extract. It's it's okay unless there is a genuine concern from the parent yeah. about alcohol, and then you are immediately limited in your choice of remedies. Yeah. So tablets or glissy tracks. Now there's not a huge range of glissy tracks on the market, and and for good reason because not everything is suitable either extract to be extracted as a glissy tract or preserved with glycerin. That's why there's such a small range. Of and there, there was a company years ago uh, that came out, and the entire range was Glissy Tracks, and they didn't last. It didn't last more than five years. Mm. 
because they go off in time. They get gloopy and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So um, don't be worried about um, the alcohol. What about the concentration? I mean, Dennis Stewart has a, a he sometimes tirades about this, you know, and it's basically one comes, in one. Yeah, well, one in one. Other people will, you know, vehemently defend the one in two and certain manufacturing techniques. I exactly. have issues you know, particularly when I used to listen to, and I call them old greats, but I will be killed by Ruth Tricky if she hears me say that. But it was yeah. Ruth Tricky that opened my mind up. And she, I remember her sort of saying, you know, about the old herbalists, we're talking druids, we're talking yeah. the, the uh, you know, monasteries that used to act as herbalists, things like that. Um, exactly. They didn't do one in twos. They didn't no. do cold percolation. No, you know, they, they, they had a, a, a a whole different way of looking at a quality aspect. That's um, right, and they're, 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 I mean those those guys are really alchemists, right? They 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 pick by according to uh, astrological principles, and that whole it, it was a different you know style of herbal medicine. Mm. And and so and they also macerated, right? So a gentle a gentle you know soaking of the herb over time. Now. You know, we're just about to have a whole range of liquids come onto the market, which is going to challenge everybody's, you know, education to date around, you know, what is a good way to make an extract, right? And and undoubtedly, we'll do a podcast on that when it comes time. Okay. But these are all made through maceration. Right. They're soaked for a long period of time, and there is a remarkable difference between using these old principles and a more modern industrial process that rapidly percolates. You know, you can have you can have your remedy done in in forty eight hours. These remedies they take weeks and months. Wow! And what I noticed immediately was soft and wide. And anybody that knows, you know, aromatherapy knows that it's a you know, it's a whole extract with all the little nuances and yeah. things. You know, all the little all the little peaks in the in the you know HBLC. Well, see this. So the, you what you're saying here really reminds me of what Dennis Stewart said. Exactly. You know, that, that a, a good glass of red, like a Grange, you know, a Grange Hermitage, yeah. is not determined by the resveratrol. It has so That's many, right. mo- so much more complexity to it. We, we acknowledge it. Mm, but sure. Then, but, then, but then we look at the, we want the congeners, we want the little nuances and, the, you know, the, 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 the sublime element. Yeah. I still have this scepticism and I still need to be convinced, but I do yeah. believe truly that there's a richness to the history and culture, the knowledge, true knowledge of the yeah. use of these natural extracts, which if we get too industrialised in it, we're going to be little doctors. We're going to be little pharmacists. Exactly. And, and that's we're, fine we're, 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 if you want to do pharmacy no, or medicine. Yeah, that's <laughs> like, exactly, exactly. But we, what we do is different. Yeah. It's different. Yeah, you know, I, I absolutely agree with you. And, and I think that... that that there is now a lot of interest in looking back of of how we used to do things, and you know, and our our role now is to blend the old with the new. Mm. And it's you know, you can walk these two roads. There's no problem. I've got. I'm like you. I have no problem with science, but I, you know, because it, it's informed. It's informed us in, incredibly, right? Just medical science, understanding the body better, understanding the interactions between herbs and the body better. You know. Boy, All that body of knowledge is huge, and I acknowledge it. It's incredible. I love it. However, it doesn't answer everything. Yeah. You've got a patient sitting in front of you, and it's a huge riddle sometimes. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. I I can't wait. I'm going to come and hang out with you. Um, Please. Yes, it would be great. And I've got to say, I'm going to put the details of that course that you're doing up at Mount Barney on the Gold Coast. So if we can get those details, we'll put them up on the FX Medicine website. Okay, mate, great. There's a, there's, there's a whole flyer and stuff on it, so it'll be, it'll be awesome. And, you know, long live, you know, modern herbal medicine mixed with, you know, vital herbal medicine. You know, we've got, a, we've got a, a strong future, mate. We really do. Couldn't be better said. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Hi, I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Here at FX Medicine, we strive to remain clinically relevant. So stay in touch with us and please let us know how we're doing. We love hearing from you. You can email info at fxmedicine.com.au or contact us via Facebook, Twitter and Instagram.